it is a collaboration that's a book, but not a book that you'd bring to bed with you before turning the lights out. It's also been described as protest beauty and as the collaboration of a printer, really a book artist, and a poet who've created a full multi-sensory experience about both personal and collective crises of the past few years, or so it's described in the introduction. The book is Heavy Lifting. The printer is Felicia Rice of Moving Parts Press and the poet Teresa Whitehill. And we talked to them today via Zoom to see how all this came together, what it means to create stunning works of art that are also books, and how we engage the realities of the Anthropocene. Ladies, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. A delight. To, my pleasure. Felicia, the, the project literally comes out of the ashes of your home and studio. Is it still painful to talk about that? I, uh, in the face of crisis, I seem to get a, another wind. I felt that the loss of the physical home and um, my shop of 45 years was not, uh, nothing was broken. We, it was possible to recover from that, to, to create a new studio to go on. So um, I feel so grateful to be at this point in, in the recovery process because when it when the fire swept through in August of 2020, uh, almost immediately uh, followers and friends and family started to donate to a uh, crowdsourcing GoFundMe um, put together by colleagues. And wow, 800 individuals, organizations and institutions have donated uh, over the last two and a half years and have made possible the construction of this entire new beautiful studio here in Mendocino, California. So I was bounced from the Santa Cruz Mountains, which continue to be visited by incredible natural disasters um, and uh, Santa Cruz County and the mountains as well. And uh, there were eight inches of snow in central California mountains this year. <laughs> and I wasn't there. For the first time in 25 years, I was here in Mendocino in this new space, which is just, you know, gobstoppingly beautiful. And I have uh, found a, a, a new home for my work and am busily building community here in this new community. Prepare for the plague of locusts. That can't yeah. be far behind. Okay. Um, tell us the name of the fire that took out your studio, your house. It's called the CZU Lightning Complex Fire. There were a series of fires started all over uh, coastal California, really, at that time. But Santa Cruz County was and mountains were hit particularly hard, and about a thousand structures, buildings, homes were destroyed. And I was a renter, so I had no serious stake and my whole all my wealth was not socked in my property and uh, we were able to simply move to the family home which was between tenants I mean nobody suffered from loss of home in that way and we um, have had a wonderful place to live and um, were welcomed by Teresa she and I were already moving work forward on a project but we didn't know exactly what form it was going to take and um, here I was suddenly in her backyard in Mendocino County and we could work super closely together over the last two and a half years and and um, evolve the project heavy lifting yeah. tell us about how you first got involved in book arts uh, I started as a teenager. I, I uh, was um, very young. I was raised in a family of artists and um, every medium had been snagged and developed by somebody, but um, setting type by hand and making beautiful books and working as a printer and a letterpress printer and running a little business, all that was up for grabs. And I just snagged it. And it turned out to be just this wonderful um, opportunity to explore the world of letters, as well as craft, fine craft and the arts. Um, 
it never has gotten, uh, I've never come to a dead end in um, 45 years. I started my press in 1977. I started printing earlier than that and um, has always been a source of um, uh, a touchstone for my identity. Absolutely, how I move through the world, how I approach the world, how I fit in the world and um, has brought so many, so many wonderful, interesting, intriguing, you know, people into my life. So I, I, that's how I started. Um, and I studied with some important uh, West Coast printers, hand, uh, hand press and fine press printers, and learned about typography and paper and materials and just went on from there. Give us the names of a couple of those folks. I worked with a man named William Everson, the um, poet printer. Um, I worked with a designer and printer named Jack Stoffaker, uh, based in San Francisco, really important uh, to West Coast sensibilities of type and, and typography. Um, those were a couple of uh, folks that I was able to work with right off the bat. I, I, I sought out a place where I could at UC Santa Cruz where I could uh, go study with, with master printers, but at the same time, well, if I didn't like it, maybe I'd become a biology major, but it really didn't happen. I was, I was, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, Santa Cruz was this just gorgeous city, the university on the hill, our little press there with a view of the entire Monterey Bay, the Pacific Ocean. I mean, I thought I had died and gone to heaven and I'm a California coastal person right on the ocean my whole life. And, um, and there I was, but it was a little town. It was a little city. And there were a lot of young people moving. It's the seventies moving into town and creating alternative culture and uh, an alternative uh, small business community that I joined. So um, I was part of a print collective that's still going to, to this day, uh, job shop. I was I started moving parts press in 1977 out of a garage in downtown Santa Cruz. Hmm. Teresa, Felicia was about to get into it, but the genesis of your collaboration, maybe you could speak to that. Sure. Yeah, well, Felicia and I had known each other through book arts for a long, long time. Um, I had studied book arts at Mills College in the early 1980s, moved to Mendocino in mid-1980s, mid, mid and Felicia's parents had founded the Mendocino, uh, were some co-founders co of the Mendocino Arts Center, and I knew of Felicia through my letterpress connections. So we had visited with each other on and off over the years, but it was in 2019 that I attended a lecture that Felicia gave at the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. And I wrote a poem about the experience afterward in my journal um, and sent the poem to her uh, some months later. It took me a couple of months to get up the nerve because I felt like, God, I'm so presum presumptuous. And uh, she wrote back and said, you know, I'm working on this project. I, I have this tree that was beautiful tree in my front yard that was unjustly cut down. And I've made these beautiful rubbings out of the giant oak rounds. And I, I, want, I want to work on something and something in your poem speaks to me. And would you be interested in bouncing this around a little bit? And I wrote back and said, you know, sure, what, you know, what do you have in mind? And we started emailing each other. And so we've both done quite a bit of collaborative work with other artists in the past. So we, we've each brought a lot of experience about collaboration. And so we began to, we began to write to each other, um, sometimes almost on, on almost daily basis. And I happened to come over to Mendocino to meet with her in August of um, 2020. And she was getting her family home ready to rent out. And uh, she showed me some of the early gravestone rubbings that she had made thinking to make, use them to make 
alphabets, make words with them. And that went into the crisis panel of the heavy lifting book. And so it was really great to get a sense of her process when she begins to design one of these, one of these books. Um, it's, it's a multi-year process that she's gone through multiple times. And I was just so impressed with the depth of research and the amount of ongoing innovation that she brings to each and every project. So she goes after an effect that she wants, even if it means she has to learn a whole new technique. And so she was showing me some of the images she had gathered. And our idea was that the poem might inspired some of her bird images that she was drawing and that she would show me images she was doing and hope that it might inspire some writing on my part. So I began to keep a, a dedicated journal, my heavy lifting journal, which I wrote in every day for about a year and a half. And all the time feeding each other little snippets of thoughts at dawn and um, meeting in each other's spaces and uh, wow. yeah, yeah. There's a, a great quote by Allen Ginsberg, and I paraphrase: "You can write as you can write anything you want as long as you don't show anybody." But this is not like that. This is how do you, and I want to know how do you write for something that you know is going to be an art book that is how much does this is this is a couple hundred several hundred dollar book a thousand dollar book I have no idea even what the price is for the art book. But it's, you know, it's not, the, the stakes are rather high. How do you, how does that factor in? Or how do you actually write poetry for a project like this? Yeah, you talked about keeping a, a journal, a dedicated journal, that's part of it. But please give us a little bit of a glimpse into that process. Well, you know, the more intimidating part, I think because I am a letterpress printer um, and I've been involved in book arts for so many years, that aspect was, was, um, amazing, but it wasn't the intimidating part. <laughs> uh, Felicia had been gathering these images off the internet and um, that were part of the, what, what she was calling the, the collective crises. So we were, there was this dichotomy between our personal griefs and crises that we had been individually going through. And then these collective crises because we were starting to realize that we were being pounded. There was, you know, there was with the 2016 election, there was this threat of totalitarianism, there was the catastrophic wildfires, there's a global, you know, climate change issues. And then we have COVID, and then in the middle of that, COVID and George Floyd's murder. And I said to Felicia at one point, you know, I think we're all just in collective shock. I, I think we need to treat ourselves as if we were in medical, this medical state of shock, because this is too much. This is, and, and, but this is what this project was coming to be about. And so the, the most intimidating thing for me was like, wow. So I'm being um, challenged to rise to this occasion. And I thought, oh my God. And at the time I, I, you know, I wasn't sure I could do it. You know, I could, but I wasn't sure I could do justice to it. And, you know, I didn't want to get rhetorical. I didn't, you know, I, it was such a tricky thing to where, you know, how do I strike this balance? And I, so I just decided not to worry about it. I just kept writing in my journal and trusting my process and slowly started extracting parts out of the journals that began working copies of the poems and then doing my usual process with poems of walking them around and reading parts of them out loud and Kind of collaborating with myself in a way, you know, like listening to my own voice, and um, and then 
the first time I brought a group of the early draft of the poems over to Felicia's to read to her, I was just so nervous. <laughs> I remember that. Well, she's smiling and the book is out, so I guess everything worked <laughs> out. Uh, how about reading a poem for us so we get a sense of that? Sure. I, I picked out Courtship, Grief, Rain. As, yeah, as. can do. Right. Courtship, Grief, Rain. The Irish of my forebears wore their clothes backwards or inside out on Beltane to ward off the mischief of the fairies. The year my father died, I found myself wearing socks of different colors, having dressed in the dark or in the absent-mindedness of grief. I began to deliberately wear socks of different colors as an homage to this man who used to tell me I wore too much black. A friend told me she noticed that the faces of those who had lost their homes in a firestorm could begin to take on a swollen, discarded look. I wore my clothes inside out sometimes, again, at first carelessly and then deliberately. I put socks on with different colors on each foot, but of the same pattern. I wanted to reckon with this time with its kaleidoscope with its chaos. I knew I had to do more than just endure. I had to meet her part way, this grief of mine. Enter her world as a beloved in courtship, make love to grief. I could apply the lessons of all lovers, make a devoted study of her pleasures and her necessities, the little habits that betray her longings so that I could be artful with them, so that I could satisfy and more than satisfy her desire. Blue for the catastrophic wildfires, one after another in a long series of hiccups, belching smoke and flame like any old dragon, I would conquer them with blue. Purple then, lavender and softer shades of pink, for the amusement of children who could point to me in the grocery store shyly, whispering to their parents about the lady with the different colored socks. Golden yellow for the planet's seizure, its constriction of species, and for the loss of pure water. Green, a kind of green for the modeled enragement of life that I feel listening to certain cellos on the radio. Peach is the sunshine. Tangerine is the fire engendered sun. Pale green sheening to gold is the trim on the acrobat's suit of lights. Most especially, a bed that has been draped with fresh sheets, scented with sandalwood on a morning after the rains have returned from their quiet gestation in a decades long drought. You know, you might have beckoned the rains to come back. Maybe you should, you can back <laughs> off a little now. <laughs> Own it down. Beautiful. Oh, it's, it's pretty powerful. I mean, you have to be careful what you, uh, what you write. I, one line, one phrase from the, from the book talks about how I realized I could, I could never sleep, not just that particular night, but ever again. And oh my God, I've been having <laughs> so much insomnia. <laughs> well, uh, Robert Duncan, uh, I, I just have been going into this Duncan, not too far from where you guys are, but uh, he said that the, uh, I want to get the quote exactly right, every present activity in the poem redistributes future as well as past events. I love oh, yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. There's so much I could follow up on that, but I really want to get a sense of the physical process of how a book like this comes together. Might be a good time for me to share the screen and to show uh, what the book looks like. So I'll do that, Felicia, and mm -hmm. uh, people can get a sense. Um, sort of opens up 
in the middle when you open up this book. And Pete, there is a video that people can watch and get a sense of that. But um, take us through the physical process of how this book came together. Well, it's two panels that nest into one another. And the rear taller panel represents sort of my personal journey uh, through a crisis and some hope for recovery. Uh, I resisted the hope for recovery. A lot of this work went on really in the depths of my um, struggling, uh, flailing around. And, um, and the stanza from the poem that Teresa wrote uh, is from a, uh, it's a poem called The Loveliness of Mistakes. And um, she did gift it to, you know, write it for me and tentatively share it with me. But boy, that last stanza just nailed me. And I, I really used it as a touchstone during difficult times. And it was a matter of drawing, making drawings. And then I uh, was able to acquire a laser cutter and cut plates that I could print in relief on my proof press, my Vandercook proof press. So I'm a relief printmaker and um, layers and layers of color. And then the shorter panel is um, the language, the, the letters from the rubbings at the cemetery in um, cemeteries in Mendocino and forming words that are these crises. I had boiled it down to eight and I actually left room for World War III, but I wasn't uh, necessary to um, print it yet in there. I, I, as I say, I won't do, I won't be printing that because the book is completed. And um, wow, I'm so glad the book is completed. It's amazing. So that was printed also on the proof press and there in the middle on the bottom, you can see the uh, Jimmy Brown and the Little River Builders who built my new studio, moving it, pushing it into the new studio. I was working out of a shipping container and you can see on the bottom, an old shed and a shipping container side by side. And I worked in both of them. I worked in the shed and moved the press into the shipping. Container. This was not a, shed, a press or any equipment that I had when I arrived here. Um, in the middle line, you can see the new studio on the left with the beautiful uh, new space and the, and the press there. And it's just a very simple new space, but it's all new to me. All this equipment is new, but I do have to say that having had a, a studio or print shop for so many years, I kind of knew exactly what I wanted. I knew exactly what was going to be too much and what was enough. And um, the big addition was the laser cutter to my life, which was has been a, a challenge and uh, produced some really great effects. I'm just so excited about it. Yeah. There's something cool about being able to get a fresh start and, and um, having the community support for the funding uh, it makes it a lot easier. And uh, you know, we get to start again. So there's there's something good in that, yes? Yeah, well, I, I if I had a moment where I thought now's the time to take up feather work, you know, letterpress and metal types, very heavy. It's been a big weight in my life as well. It's been a ballast. And um, to lose it all was something that I would say over the years, I'm not leaving this work until I'm burned out. Like it was burned out or burned out well I was literally burned out and everyone said no Felicia go 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 and so if I was thinking of doing something else no way no way this was it people people let me know in no uncertain terms that it was valuable although they'll tell me you know you could have done something else it would have been okay but I don't think I could have done something else this is part of my being my fiber yeah I understand that. There is a very political aspect of this project. I mean, the content itself obviously is political. The fact that you were considering putting World War III or that you left a space for that shows that you're uh, attuned to politics and concerned about them. But you're taking um, this work into communities that have been ravaged by fires of the last several years. So talk about the political activism aspect of this project my work uh, who am i sorry? sorry i don't i didn't have a person in mind to talk about it but felicia uh, why don't you go, go. teresa you go well i when felicia and i did talk about um you know bringing this work to the public you know what we wanted to see and we you know the more we we spoke about it the more we realized that we really wanted to 
use it as a catalyst. Um, this is our take on what's been going on over the past several years. And, and it's our witnessing and kind of reflecting and uh, in that sacred role that artists have of, of bearing witness and um, reflecting back and making new realities out of you know, existing events. And we realized, you know, that we that one of the things that got lost in the pandemic was community. Uh, there was so much isolation. I, I think we haven't really quite grasped how much that extended isolation isolation has changed us all. And I, I got I really began to feel like we needed a can opener to like pry open that isolation and begin to speak to one another again. And I, we thought, you know, we could use this as, as a catalyst. We could go to different communities and, you know, say like, this is what happened to us. What happened to you? You know, we, we want to, we're here because we want to hear from you. And we, we were able at our first, at the launch of the book project in on the Mendocino coast, just, uh, just about two weeks ago to uh, put that into, into practice. And uh, boy, it turned out better than I could have, really could have hoped for. It was amazing what people stood up and started talking about. Yeah. yeah it's really an invitation to um, share your experiences and we'll, we'll, we'll show you ours, you know, you show you us yours. And um, together we can see if there's anything there that uh, helps us move forward um, because you sometimes wonder, not sometimes, we know that the future is in jeopardy. And so, um, ha, 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 and we know there will be one. So what will it look like? We are crafting that now, we're envisioning, we're imagining that now. So this is part of the listening tour that we're on, which we're taking the book out around Mendocino County, which is the size of Rhode Island. And there is no central place where everyone will come for a night or a, a month long show. So on the road, we go with this pop-up event that's going to public libraries, a community room at the museum, a starlight lounge of the Willits a community theater, um, a, a, another museum in Lake County, and then down to Santa Cruz, um, in July, and then uh, back to Berkeley in September, and um, things are starting to evolve that we hadn't even planned. People are inviting us to come, and we hope to visit other communities that have experienced fire, which is just a common denominator in California at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, although fire is central to this piece, it expands out into the many other areas that we're we're all facing together, and the, um, the this is a way to to jumpstart conversation and dialogue. Apparently, that's been successful, as Teresa was saying. Teresa, yeah. can you t tell us about some of the more noteworthy comments in this listening series that you've that you've experienced? Well, what I was impressed by, you know, because the the um, uh, I remember Mar Margaret Hull of the rabbi, because we were, the event was in the shul in the Jewish um, community center in Casper. And uh, she got up when she w was to speak and said, uh, you know, when I saw the images on that crisis panel, I, I wanted this event to come, but I was also a little concerned that they were gonna come like shaking their finger at us all and saying, you, all, you should do this and we should do that. And do more. And, imperatives and must must and she said I'm that's not what I'm hearing at all here today I'm hearing a lot about personal grief uh, a lot of people got up and began to speak about loss um and and including a couple of people who signed up on the on the list to speak thinking that they were signing up to get a copy of the book <laughs> <laughs> And they turned out to be the most amazing speakers because they were just, they weren't reading prepared poetry or a prepared talk. They were just speaking from their heart. And that, that really is what we were hoping for. But there was a great deal about 
how all these external crises were exacerbated by the fact that we were all individually going through different, um, you know, personal loss. Yeah, one of the ways you can tell that things haven't returned to whatever uh, quote unquote normal was before, one of the ways you can tell is the number of people who are ordering out at restaurants. You know, instead of going to a restaurant, sitting down and having a meal, we went to one in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and uh, we were the only couple. Eventually, another couple came in, but they must have had 20 or 25 orders go out in that time. And it wasn't like that before COVID. You know, COVID changed Mm -hmm. that. Uh, Another thing that comes up is um, I had a small fire in an apartment, nothing like you all have experienced, very minor but I had an uh, an African friend, indigenous African friend, who said, when he heard about the fire, he said, I wonder what the ancestors are trying to tell you, <laughs> is what he said to me. Mm. Yeah, that's the question mm. I would have, um, Felicia, for you because of the mm-hmm. fire. And uh, maybe for both of you, in terms of what the ancestors, or perhaps uh, whatever divine intelligence is responsible for these things is trying to tell us about the fires uh, in North America. Well, I have to read this one verse from Teresa that I made the centerpiece for the um, birds panel. And it closes, the, the poem is the loveliness of the mistakes, as I said earlier, and it closes with this bit. So this partial journey, you might complete it. There's no guarantee. You will map the energy of the gods to the little that you have been able to pin down, and you will be proud of your energy and your love, your energies and your loves, your lovely energy, your proud love, your willingness to mingle in the halls of the dead, bringing the dead treasures that cause their eyes to light up, putting smiles back on faces that have lost flesh. You will speak to birds. So, my relationship with the dead is. active, um, honoring, uh, acknowledging, preserving uh, through craft, uh, preserving the craft of letterpress printing um, through um, my family home here, which I have been absent from for 50 years here, a period of really uh, feeling the energy of my parents and their lives and, and what they looked like and putting smiles back on faces that have lost flesh, honoring my teachers. This has just always been honoring the ancestors, I suppose, has always been part of my practice. I don't see them as malevolent. I I don't think they sent fire like as some sort of destructive force for my, for for me. Um, No, 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 I don't see that either. No. Uh, I see it as something in your life that you need to pay attention to. That's the way I took it. When the mm-hmm. fire was, uh, you know, in in my home, um, mm-hmm. this would be a good time for another screen share because there's a great um, web page with a lot of links, as I recall. This one here, and as you're talking, I want to go down all the way down to um, this particular link right here mm-hmm. that says Ray and Miriam Rice, mm-hmm. and um, so talking about, you just mentioned it, in fact, uh, yeah. and I think this is what you, in part, what you were referring to. Yeah, this is my mom and dad, who were both artists, uh, ended the la- last uh, third of their lives here in Mendocino on the coast. Um, they were met in New York in art school and in the early 40s, and um, they weathered the Second World War and went on to have three children. I'm the youngest. And uh, it was always a matter of continuing to work. There was no question, uh, exploring mosaics, paintings, sculptures, films, drawings. Um, In fact, the film that uh, I've made, we've made in, uh, that accompanies the book is really um, a dedication to my father who was an independent animated um, art filmmaker, experimental filmmaker in the 60s and 70s. So um, the model of discipline and hard work and um, perseverance came through in spades from my parents. Yeah, I can, I can just imagine. 
uh, Teresa, there's um, something in the book that goes, war then, the background always, dreamers and heretics always. Yeah. What's, yeah. What's, can you elaborate on your heretical streak? <laughs> yeah, I, um, in, a, in a way, this project allowed me to put together a lot of things that I've been burning to find a form for. And I, I don't know if that's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but I, but I, I realized at a certain point that, you know, you know, part of my ancestors are the community of artists. And I've lived in Mendocino County now uh, for over 30 years. And, and, and it has uh, quite a number of what I would call righteous renegades. And they're, they're my heroes. And uh, so dreamers and heretics, you know, Mary Corta is a dreamer and a heretic. And um, a lot of the poets, Mendocino County poets, who are my mentors, you know, Bill Brad and uh, Devro Baker and uh, uh, Gordon Black, you know, they, you know, we've we've gathered. You know, Sharon Dubiago. Um, I feel like we we are a, a tribe, a family, and we have, you know, supported each other in our eccentric and. Uh, idiosyncratic ways um, but and but there's it's it's a real culture it's a, a you know a living breathing entity this this um, exchange that we undergo when we create and share with each other so uh, and I feel that now especially now it's really important that arts um, continue because I, I believe it is the art that's going to balance the science that will solve, resolve, or find a way forward uh, through all kinds of social issues. Yeah, that all seem to be uh, peaking at the at the same time. Mm -hmm. The there was I understand um, an immigration category in the UK years ago. I don't know if it still exists, but uh, it would they could check a box if a person was a harmless eccentric. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that seems to me the people that you're talking about. And yeah. you know, to throw down to say, well, you want me to back up the heretics? Here's William Everson, here's Mary Norbert Cordy. I mean, holy shit. Um, how do you measure success for a project like this? Uh, aside from making sure that no natural disasters hit the new place and that um, you uh, that everybody who wants one of these books gets it and that anyone who wants to even look at it gets a chance to look at it. What are other ways that you measure success for this project? I, I have a very simple way of measuring success. And it took a lot of years to arrive here and I could deliver this to any young person and they may not be able to absorb it, but it's super simple. The ability to continue, whatever that means for you, whatever the next step is, the ability to take that next step. So the work doesn't have to support me. It, it Hopefully it supports itself. There's the energy and the interest to continue the world can shut down and if I can still continue on some level, then I'm experienced success. So it's really important as an artist not to be caught up in the um, material uh, commercial um, definitions of our capitalist society. It's just critical to realize that there are many forces ranged against you know, the star system in New York uh, happening to you. That's just, an anomalous. Fortunately, I, I was raised by artists and they said, you know, it's every generation has to create their own economy. I'm going, I have to create my own job. And what and she, every generation has to do that. And um, you, the, the star system is new. 
it, you know, Basquiat, that whole crazy auction thing. It's fairly new in the history of the arts. Um, it probably won't continue. You know, this isn't like evolution and everything just gets better and better. Isn't that the message in all, all of this and the whole project is that we, we, this is a check, you know, we have to check ourselves. We have to check where we are in time and place and space and decide if this is where we want to be and um, can we continue and can we continue to work on the side of light and put put smiles back on the faces of those who have lost flesh and move forward um, somehow in some way um, if the spirit is so critical to that the the, the will the the energies the proud love the energies the proud love and um that's you know that's my measure of success do i have any is there any you know is there any in here oh i've got some you know put it out that's um success you say every generation has to have its own create its own economy every gener it is said every generation has its own fascism mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. this also seem this project also seems to be a gentle uh active resistance to the growing fascism in this country, which is by far has not been resolved. And uh, we'll probably see a lot of what's to happen in, in the months ahead. Teresa, maybe you leave us with a poem from the book that you feel might be an appropriate way to close things. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the title poem because I think that is a great introduction for people to the project, heavy lifting. This is the pause I am flying in, flying hard so as not to fall to earth. Apparently, grief is not a calm, but a huge effort. Letter from a friend, heavy lifting. It's hard to convey the crisis that happened to us back in the early 21st century the multiple crises, the concatenation of disasters, the wounding, the beginning of the ending of the wounding, the unraveling of all that had gone before. That we were already carrying the burden of the dying off of the polar bears and the failing of the glaciers, that was hard enough. But it was when birds began to fall out of the sky, emaciated, desperate, if not already dead, that we realized we were no longer living in the time of prophecy, no longer in the theory of it all. It was unfolding all around us, one heart stop after another, a chain reaction of seemingly helpless events. We had poisoned the well. And just because we couldn't conceive of it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that we couldn't conceive of it because there it was, looking up, the blue heron folded over on itself, heading south in the early sky, and north, crossing paths, a helicopter. From this time, we date a different life. The stories we told our children changed at this time. Our dreams changed. Some of us stopped dreaming. Others registered guns or took part in compromised immune systems. War then, the background always, dreamers and heretics always. And out of this arose a powerful and dangerous tendency, a hiccup in history, a scratch in the record's fine vinyl grooves that caused it to skip and repeat unerringly so that while some of us were remembering, were touching our faces to the glass, others were forgetting. Or not so much forgetting as to never have taken in those events that were more than the consciousness could bear. We lived in that nervous slice between forgetting and the inevitable. This was the place we were brought to, where we could stand and look out and call out to our children. This is the place where we lived and where we ate and made love amidst emergency vehicles and fraud and the study of legal briefs. 
among our most sacred texts that had become practically useless to us. They were all on fire anyway. Birds were at one time used as weapons of war. They would be doused with flammable fluid and lit on fire and sent into the enemy's lines. Incendiary birds could change the fate of battles. Everywhere we went, there was this upwelling of the things of the earth. Butterflies, yes, the leafing out of the oak, the composition of new forms of music, but also tombstones, defunct tractors, oil tankers run aground, the bellies of salamanders, the windows without glass. We will make do with what we are given. A grammar of what exists in which grief is a lo room locked up within the emptiness of the sky. You who come after us will carry the earth on your shoulders as birds carry the air and are carried. Be lifted by these things that broke us. Amen to that. I'm thinking of my daughter just turned 11. And if she were to read something like that 20, 30, 40 years from now, she'll say, okay, it wasn't just me thinking that this was not normal, right? Whatever is normal, I don't know. But it certainly was in the last few years. And you speak to that very eloquently. What a delight to be able to talk to you about this project. I can't wait to see the book. I look forward to seeing it very soon. And I wish you, and however you measure it, Huge success with this and with future projects. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul.